Most people believe wood is weak, temporary, and doomed to rot, while stone is permanent. But honestly, that belief is one of the greatest misconceptions in historical construction. Across Europe, Asia, the Arctic, and even parts of Africa, there are wooden structures that have survived longer than nearby stone walls, cathedrals, and fortresses. And it's not because the wood was special, but because the builders understood something we largely forgot. They knew how to turn wood black, dense, toxic to insects, hostile to fungi, and nearly immune to water. They didn't paint it. They didn't seal it with modern chemicals. They transformed it. What you're looking at in ancient harbours, Viking churches, frontier palisades, and war infrastructure is not untreated timber, but deliberately altered material engineered to survive centuries. Today, we're going to examine those black treatments, how they worked, why they outperformed stone in many environments and how the same principles can still be applied by anyone serious about historical methods or long-term survival construction. Why did ancient builders distrust stone more than wood? Well, stone fails in predictable but destructive ways. Freeze-thaw cycles crack it from the inside. Salts migrate through it and cause surface spalling. Mortar erodes and turns walls into stacked rubble. Ancient builders knew this intimately. In wet climates, stone foundations collapse faster than treated timber piles. In coastal zones, salt water ate limestone alive. In cold regions, stone fractured while wood flexed and survived. Wood, when properly treated, did not crack under stress. It absorbed shock. It resisted sudden thermal change. But untreated wood rotted quickly, so ancient societies developed methods to alter its chemistry rather than merely protect its surface. Those methods all shared one thing in common. They turned the wood black. Charring is not just surface protection. It's a chemical transformation. The most misunderstood black treatment is charring. Many people today think charring is cosmetic or symbolic. In reality, it is a controlled chemical reaction. When wood is exposed to fire at the right temperature and duration, cellulose and hemicellulose break down while lignin reorganizes into a carbon-rich layer. That layer becomes hydrophobic, meaning it repels water instead of absorbing it. It also becomes hostile to fungi and insects because the sugars they feed on are destroyed. This is why charred wooden piles driven into wet ground can last longer than uncharred stone footings. Roman bridge piles, Viking harbour posts and Japanese temple beams all use variations of this technique. The key was not burning the wood, but hardening it. A light surface char followed by brushing and sealing created a barrier that water could not penetrate. If you wanted to apply this today, you would. Media group, carpenter selecting dense timber logs, pile of dense wood ready for treatment, stock should distribute equally, select dense wood, Char it evenly until the surface cracks slightly. Brush off loose carbon. And then oil it with pine tar or animal fat to lock the carbon in place. Pine tar and resin acted as biological weapons against decay. Pine tar was not a coating in the modern sense. It was a biological weapon. Produced in low oxygen pits by slowly heating pine roots and stumps, pine tar concentrated phenols, resins and acids that fungi and insects could not survive. Scandinavian ships, medieval roofs, frontier cabins and siege equipment were saturated with it. When absorbed into wood, 
pine tar didn't just sit on the surface, it penetrated deeply, replacing moisture and filling capillaries. This made the wood flexible rather than brittle, water-resistant without being sealed, and self-healing when scratched. If you examine surviving medieval beams, you'll notice the black coloration goes millimetres deep, not just skin deep. That depth is what allowed these structures to endure centuries of rain, snow and salt air. A practical modern application would involve heating pine tar until thin, applying it to warm wood so it penetrates deeply, and reapplying over time rather than trying to create a permanent surface seal. Charcoal slurry and ash washes served as alkaline preservation. In many cultures, builders combined char with ash or charcoal slurry. This was not superstition. Wood-destroying fungi, you see, require a mildly acidic environment. Ash and charcoal, on the other hand, are alkaline. By washing wood with ash water or charcoal paste, ancient builders raised the pH of the surface and pores, creating conditions where decay organisms simply could not survive. This method was widely used in Eastern Europe, parts of Asia, and in frontier military construction where tar was scarce. The wood darkened, hardened, and resisted mould even in damp conditions. When paired with periodic reapplication, these treatments actually rivaled stone durability in wet soil. For someone applying this today, hardwood ash mixed with water into a thin slurry can be brushed onto exterior wood, allowed to dry, and then sealed lightly with oil. It is crude by modern standards, but chemically sound. Salt water, tannins, and iron reactions, these uh, played a pivotal role in the longevity of ancient wooden structures. Coastal and river cultures often soaked wood in salt water before use. This process leached out sugars while infusing salts that inhibited fungal growth. Oak, which is rich in tannins, reacted especially well to this method. When combined with iron fasteners, tannins formed iron tannate compounds that darkened the wood and, you know, further increased decay resistance. This is precisely why medieval shipwreck timbers are often black and remarkably still intact. The wood itself became chemically altered through mineral interaction. Interestingly, stone harbours crumbled while wooden piers remained usable. Modern builders rarely exploit this knowledge, but soaking oak or similar tannin-rich wood before construction still produces measurable improvements in longevity. Why black wood survived warfare better than stone is honestly a fascinating topic. From a military perspective, treated wood outperformed stone in several key ways. It absorbed shock from artillery and siege engines instead of, well, shattering. It could be repaired quickly. It did not produce deadly shrapnel. During prolonged conflicts, timber defences treated with tar and char remained serviceable long after stone walls collapsed or became liabilities. This is why many frontier forts, trench systems, and wartime shelters relied on treated timber even when stone was available. The black coloration often seen in surviving military wood is evidence of deliberate preservation, not neglect. Applying ancient treatments in modern survival contexts is, I think, more relevant than ever. For anyone interested in long-term off-grid structures, historical reconstruction or disaster-resilient building, these methods are still relevant. A fence post charred and tarred will outlast a pressure-treated one without introducing toxins into the soil. A timber shelter treated with ash wash and oil will resist mould without trapping moisture. The key lesson here is that ancient builders worked with wood's chemistry instead of fighting it.
They accepted weathering and planned for maintenance rather than pretending permanence existed. The reason ancient treated wood outlives stone is not mystery or myth. It is chemistry, biology, and experience passed down through generations who, frankly, had no margin for failure. When you see blackened beams in old churches, ships, or fortifications, you are looking at intentional engineering, not decay. If this kind of deep, practical history matters to you, if you care about understanding how people actually survived and built in hostile environments, then this channel exists for you. Subscribe to Forgotten Frontlines, share this episode with someone who still thinks stone always wins, and stay with us as we continue uncovering the hard knowledge history tried to bury.